everyone, and welcome to Historia Canadiana. My name is Patrick, and with me, as always, is the ultimate anime fan of the podcast, Mackenzie. It's going to out me like that. Okay, cool. Absolutely. Cool. cool, cool, cool. We just, I mean, why not? I, you just told me about a seemingly great anime, so I'll just label you uh, as an anime fan just uh, based on that alone. So, yeah, that's it. Well, you that's... know, you want to know what else I'm fearing of? Canadian history and literature. Amazing segue. Right. So today (laughs) we're kind of continuing up and pretty much wrapping up because we're pretty fast approaching Confederation finally by talking before. I feel as well. But yeah, we've we've kind of had some delays in the production of episodes. That's mostly on me. Um, so apologies for that. So it might seem longer than it actually is to take (laughs) to get to Confederation, but we're getting there. Today we're actually talking about the kind of event that led to the very direct creation of British Columbia as a colony. British um, Columbia. Which is that the forgotten Monty Python sketch, British Columbia. <laughs> anyway, doesn't matter. Um, yeah, so yeah, we're kind of talking, we're going to be talking about the Fraser Gold Rush and the creation of British Columbia as a colony, which obviously directly leads into Confederation as a project, because British Columbia was integral to that idea. So before we get started, yes, the episode is late uh, this week because last week I was away. Internet and... problems. Exactly. So apologies for the delay. For so, yeah. all 10 of you that listen right now. Hey, 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 now. No, no, we we regularly get like hundreds of listeners an episode. We've massively improved in our followership and we reached number 96 on the Canadian history charts, on the history charts in Canada for podcasts. So we reached the top 100 momentarily, then we kind of fluctuated, but we reached top 100. Yeah. So don't bash our listenership. man. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. I don't, I don't get it either. It's great. Anyway, point is, before we get started, we obviously like to thank our patrons, uh, Craig, Elise, uh, Jessica. Thank you very much for supporting. If you want to join them in our patron hall of fame, you can support the show for $3 a month or a dollar a month. At $3 a month, you get an extra episode a month led by Mackenzie, which is all about pop culture in Canada. And we sort of talk about something tangentially related to what we're talking about today. Absolutely. Uh, So one of the episodes, one of our better episodes, according to our reviewers, is on the Yukon Gold uh, Rush. Uh, Sorry, that's the Klondike Klondike Gold Rush. Rush. Yeah, right, you fucking pleb. I'm sorry. It happens in the Yukon, but yes, uh, you're right. The Klondike Gold Rush, uh, which we talked about on Pop Canada. And this week, we're going to be taking a bit of a Historia Canadiana spin on this idea and talk about the Fraser Gold Rush. I'm not going to lie, I'm actually pretty excited. I love gold rushes. Okay. But I, I, love, I love gold rushes, love the Wild West, love the frontier. It's fun times, man. Well, I'm, I'm actually kind of curious, right? So to kind of get us onto topic, what is it about gold rushes that kind of interests you? It's just the idea. Okay. You know, we are, as we as humans as a species, are one of discovering exploration. Okay. It's what yep. we do, you know? When we don't explore, we stagnate. Mm-hmm. That's, why, that's why we go to space. If that's why we travel as deep as we can in the ocean. That's why we send people onto the moon. It's why we send people around the world. It's because it's what we do. Yeah, absolutely. So gold rushes really are the most romantic idea of that. It is literally mm. hunting for riches. Yeah. Like, I think it, this idea of romanticism is going to come up a bit, but yeah. And it, it's also, it, it's a purest form. Mm-hmm. Like there is no bullshit. There is no like bullshit excuse or motivation to why we're doing it, you know? Yeah. It is literally for riches, yeah. Like, you are literally going out there and digging to find gold. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. I have a giant smile on my face right now, just because just the thought makes me giddy, you know? Yeah, it's... uh... Yeah, you're right. Like a, a lot of these exploration ideas, right, that you were talking about also have sometimes this uh, monetary element to it, right? Uh, uh, colonization, imperial, like all of that when uh, had definitely a, a monetary element, even going to the moon, right, the, for resources and stuff like that. But they mm-hmm. also have like an element of knowledge, right, and exploration, that kind of thing. 
Whereas you're right, any kind of gold rush is unabashedly about, hey, we're actually literally going to strike gold. And that's really cool. Yeah, I, I definitely like that idea. It's just, it's so much fun, you know, these guys. I also love the insanity to it. As we're going to see here, you have this giant herd migration of people, thousands mm -hmm. upon thousands of people. And at the time, like 30,000 is a big number to travel yeah. anywhere that all just rush out west because of the mere rumor and thought of gold. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. By the way, today, we're just before I forget, we're going to be talking about a piece of literature, but a piece of literature that is contemporary to our time. Uh, we'll talk about it later. There was a kind of print culture that was happening in this area as well. But I feel like we've talked about it a lot in the past of similar types of print cultures. So it'll be less the focus of this episode in terms of literature. And right, the novel that we have is was actually published last year, I want to say 2020, 2021. You can find it for free on, uh, you can find a sample of it online, but it's also, I think, like five bucks on Google Play or something like that if you want to look for it. Um, it's called The Deadly Five, and it's actually written by a BC writer called Raymond Mayer. So yeah, just to kind of get into it, what's your awareness of like this British, uh, British Columbian or that area before it was called British Columbian history before the gold rush, right? So before 1858, when the gold rush happens, do you have a brief idea of it? Just sort of what we've talked about in episodes before. Mm -hmm. The James Cook one? Yeah, exactly. And sort of that sort of idea, I guess. You know, mm -hmm. so my, my my knowledge of what out what happened out west, like BC and Northwest or not the North, but like the Northern Territories and Alaska is all yep. very limited. Mm -hmm. Mostly I just know that at one point people were fighting over the fighting with the Russians over Alaska. Yep, absolutely. So yeah, the in if you want like the long and short of it uh, of it, if you're wondering how things evolved in that area, the northwest coast as you were saying of Canada or North America, it pretty much evolved in a similar way to what we've been seeing on the east coast of Canada throughout the beginning of our show. But it happened somewhat later in the timeline, right, as we conceive of it. But you'll pretty much see vaguely similar steps. So Sir Francis Drake, famous explorer of the British, is said to have reached that area around the 1570s, although that's subject to debate. Um, but most certainly the uh, actual settlements uh, for trading purposes happened consistently from the 1770s onward. And it's mostly British and Spanish explorers that, as we mentioned in the James Cook episode, arrived on small islands just off what we now know as British Columbia. So they arrived in Nootka Sound, which was the focus of our James Cook episode. They arrived on Vancouver Island, that kind of thing. And for the most part, that's pretty much what it stayed at for a long time, was a few settlement and trading posts on those islands that traded with the natives. And mostly any kind of exploration and expansion was done from the much more quote unquote developed colonies in Quebec, Ontario, the Maritimes that were going westward, right? Through what we've often referred to as the mythical Northwest Passage, right? This attempt to find it. And obviously this comes and plays directly into how British Columbia would be born as well. Right. So because there were already a bunch of establishments in modern day Quebec and Ontario, it was much easier to just keep sending people that way. Uh, and the environment was much more hospitable, right? Especially in British Columbia, for those who don't know, it's a much more rocky uh, part of Canada. Not surprisingly, considering that it's the main mountain range is called the Rocky Mountain Range. <laughs> Um, bum, bum, bum. Yeah, surprisingly enough. But even like the rivers are basically rapids for a lot of them. So it's much more difficult to actually get around. And plus, you know, it's still very cold <laughs> because it's Canada. So it's not exactly the most inviting place when you could at least have a relatively decently uh, settled society in the East Coast. So it took a long time for people to actually go there on a regular basis. So have you ever heard of Simon Fraser, Mac? Um, or at least the name Fraser. I've heard the name, yeah. Right. Like the, the name of Simon Fraser has come around. Mm -hmm. So obviously Fraser is not alone in what we're going to be describing, but given that he gave his name to a lot of things in that area, we're going to kind of focus on him and use him as a model for what we're generally talking about here. 
So Fraser himself was a uh, Northwest company a trader, right? He was actually one of the youngest uh, people to be a part of that company. And the Northwest company, which was for a while, one of the biggest uh, trading for, fur trading companies in Canada, right? Competing very easily with the Hudson's Bay company. Um, he was actually tasked to expand that company's operations westward, right, into the Rocky Mountains and past it. So basically merging the British settlements of uh, Vancouver Island and all that with the eastern settlements and kind of crossing them over the Rocky Mountains. Mm -hmm. And basically, much like his predecessors of Alexander Mackenzie and all those other kinds of explorers, he was trying to find the Northwest Passage as a way to the kind of do it Northwest very Passage. Easily. Yeah. <laughs> Which it doesn't exist. It only exists when you break ice, right? The, the, the only reason that it exists is because we literally it had in ice breakers. in the minds of the Canadian people. Exactly. It, it is a myth, right? It's, it's really, it is kind of fascinating to to see this willingness to try to connect almost immediately, right? Well, to, but that's, again, that's that, that foundation of exploration. Yeah. We will believe any sort of hypothesis of golden cities and Northwest mm -hmm. passages and all those other things, just so we can like keep going, you know? Yeah. We, we, we want the journey, we want the adventure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Even small little Canada that doesn't get up to much is still like, yo, let's <laughs> find the Northwest passage. <laughs> But let's also just create it by smashing through ice. <laughs> yes. Break the ice. That's for, it's a real icebreaker. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent pun. Um, so yeah, obviously. Nailed it. <laughs> As a carpenter would say, nailed it. Thank you everyone uh, for listening to this episode of Historia Canadiana. I'm ending it right here because I cannot handle the absolute fire of these puns. Cheers, everyone. <laughs> Right. So he wouldn't obviously discover the Northwest Passage, but he did actually manage to go through what was ostensibly one of the most dangerous explorations up until that time and actually did pretty much set out a route that traders could use from east to west, right? By establishing relations with Native Americans, by just uh, exploring with a series of other Northwest Company traders or Hudson's Bay traders. And he is actually credited with the discovery. This word is always uh, obviously loaded because it was known by other people, but so he did discovered it for Europeans, right, of the Fraser River, which is the longest river in British Columbia. And it basically runs north to south on the west coast of British Columbia. Um, and obviously he gave it his name because why not be egotistical about it? Well, that's what they're all about. You have to be an egomaniac to be an explorer. I kind of feel like you have to do. That's not really a joke, though. No, it's, it yeah. isn't. You, you have to have a certain amount of ambition and ego to say that something exists and to have to maintain that belief mm -hmm. that you are right, that there is a lost city of Atlantis. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Or, you know, a possible new El Dorado, as we're going to be talking about today. Right? Say so. Yeah. If you're gonna, or, a, or a Northwest Passage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly. But I mean, at that point, right, by the time that uh, Fraser is actually exploring all of this. That would be egotistical or high on something great, man. <laughs> Like by the time of the night, the early 19th century, when Fraser is actually doing all of this, late 18th, early 19th century, like the British Empire had been like firmly established. So you did definitely have things that to back up that ego in a sense. So it's kind of, I think you're definitely hitting the nail on the head with, uh, with this, uh, with this kind of thing. You've kind of hit a point as an empire where you can quote unquote do no wrong. Right, where whatever you do, you can kind of claim it for as something discovered or some new kind of uh, unfound territory, which is kind of very interesting. Right. Fraser is actually also credited with something else outside of naming his uh, the, the longest river in British Columbia after himself. He's actually known for naming the interior of British Columbia for the first time for Europeans. And it wasn't called British Columbia. He called it New Caledonia, which... Okay. Caledonia is an old term for Scotland, right? Uh, it's a Roman term for it uh, that they used way back when, obviously, when Rome was an empire. And actually, Nova Scotia for a while had a settlement called New Caledonia as well. 
Right. So there's kind of this reoccurring idea of naming things New Scotland, um, which is, I think, very kind of cool. And there's a reason why New Caledonia was chosen by Fraser. And this kind of fits in into this idea of imagination that we're talking about here is that New Caledonia, he named it that because the sites that he saw in British Columbia reminded him of his mother's description of Scotland. Right? His mother was obviously from there. And he had never been there, but he had an imagination of what Scotland was. And mm. that's why he named British Columbia New Caledonia or essentially New Scotland. Scotland. Right. Welcome to British Columbia. <laughs> A <Absolutely>. wee little laugh. <laughs> But um, he basically I Caledonia, and I got the town in Ontario. Yeah, probably you'll have another one, right? Which points to two things: one, the incredible influence of Scottish people, because there were a lot in Canada, both as officers, they were used a lot in the British Army. What Scottish uh, people? Scottish people. Yeah. Oh yeah, Montreal's city flag has like it recognizes the four con the four major cultures that made up the city, besides mm -hmm. the First Nations, of course, yeah. and they are French, English, Irish, and Scottish, yeah. and it has. Exactly four flowers so yeah it, so it shows that and it also shows i think the power of imagining a kind of continuity right between the old world and the new right that this kind of scottish ideal of we're bringing this element from the past into this new and unexplored territory right and bringing this romantic idea with us in exploring and we're kind of replicating it as much as possible in uh in canada right so I, right. I, to me that kind of points to those two elements uh so just to kind of cap off on this uh, on this setup uh fraser upon seeing a part of british columbia known as hell's gate um he actually referred to it as quote it is so wild that i cannot find words to describe our situation at times yeah. so that pretty much gives you an idea of what we're dealing with here. This kind of s seemingly untamed territory or this territory conceived of as uncivilized and a, a genuine legitimate danger, right? It's literally called Hell's Gate <laughs> in this Hell's. case. And it kind of shows, it kind of opens up to this idea of what a lot of these settlers and traders are going to be dealing, uh, going up against when arriving in British Columbia. Uh, why can't we name things like that anymore? Honestly, how metal would it be to not live in Montreal, but live in Hell's Gate? No, but I mean, like, when we're looking <laughs> for things, like, now when we look at, like, space or whatever, it's like the galaxy of Beetlebees 5 or Andromeda yep. 6, and it's like, do we have to put a number? Like, why not call yep. it something dope, you know? What would you, like, if you had to name a star, right? You have star. a big blue star in front of you. Like, what's the first name that comes to mind? That's, like, really dope. <laughs> like a big blues star? <laughs> blues clues? I was thinking more, like, actual names of, like, blues right. musicians. Or just call it something really dumb, like Dan Aykroyd. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of down for Dan Aykroyd star. Okay. Is he yeah, the blues cool. brother? Just kind of coming back to this. So as I was saying at the beginning, Fraser was a, a Northwest Company man, but eventually, as we talked about in our Hudson's Bay episode uh, a few episodes ago, um, the Northwest Company would actually be bought by uh, the Hudson's Bay Company in 1821 after a series of financial difficulties basically made it impossible to sustain their operations. And so this whole territory that Fraser was traveling under basically came under Hudson's Bay Company control. Fraser was like, I have found this new place. And Britain was like, no, we have found this new place. Uh, it's not Britain. It's a private company that's operating completely independently from, uh, from the British uh, government, of course. Never mind the fact that a lot of its shareholders are British officials. That has nothing to do with anything. It's totally not a British imperial thing. <laughs> Anyway, so yeah, basically just kind of bring us up to speed with that episode, that past episode. Most of what we now see as from Manitoba, mostly up until British Columbia, was pretty much owned by the Hudson's Bay Company, right? It was their land to do uh, what they pleased with, to trade with. Uh, they had certain restrictions that were imposed on them by the British government, mainly in how they interacted with natives. But by and large, those were either ignored or it didn't really matter. Right, because the restrictions at some point were kind of loose. So it basically established a monopoly in what we now know as the rest of Canada after Ontario. 
point. Awesome. I've, I've kind of gotten it down pat to kind of contextualize things and get into the meat of uh, yeah. into the meat of the subject. I think I, I think I've gotten the hang of it. Forty five episodes in, I've gotten the hang of contextualizing in an efficient way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so right, fast forward to the eighteen fifties, right, where our story for this episode kind of picks up. Um, so. In this area where uh, that is mostly owned by the Hudson's Bay Company, there were certain official British colonies, such as Vancouver Island, Nootka Sound, all of that. And in some of these islands, namely Queen Charlotte Islands, uh, which is just off the coast of BC, gold had been found as early as the eighteen as the early eighteen fifties. Right? Gold. There we go. It is gold. Now, again, the term discovery is kind of weird here because it was discovered when First Nations used small portions of it to trade with Europeans. So it's not like anyone was really mining for it. It's just like it happened to fall in their hands when uh, Native American populations used it with them. Native American populations. We can't use this thing for this metal for anything. What do we do with it? Give it to the white people, I guess. (laughs) When has that ever backfired? (laughs) Anyway, uh, I'm sure nothing wrong is going to come of this. No, it's all going to be perfect. Right. So obviously natives kind of saw that some Europeans were interested in this um, in this metal or in this kind of lumpy stuff. <laughs> I mean, have you ever seen metal in its natural form? It's the most boring stuff ever. Oh, God, yeah. Well, even in general, like metal is only really good for one thing. Right. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not like it's actually that special. It's only good as a currency. Yeah. And or putting or as, like, on filaments jewelry. and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Once that was kind of established, naturally what happened, men were sent by the Hudson's Bay Company to search and check up on rumors of the fact that, hey, there's maybe gold in this area and we can maybe use it to kind of build our coffers, right? Because we're, be gold. we're still obviously in this moment where, gold, where the gold standard is a thing, right? Where the value of your currency is entirely based on how much gold you have and the value of gold. Mm. So... Naturally, if you find more gold, it'll only mean that your the value of your money will go up because that's how that works. Well, the entire world is based off its system of gold. Yeah, at this point, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of absurd <laughs> when you think about it, right? <laughs> oh, I just like the pun. Anyway, they found gold and now people are interested. Mm-hmm. However, and this is kind of where a lot of the, the, where this gold rush starts to differ from other gold rushes. Because by this point, you had already had a gold rush in California, right? And you had a great slew of people who were suddenly <laughs> just rushing towards California. You get the famous 49ers there. And you get all kinds of stories of boom towns. And the football team? Yeah. Honestly, that's what their name is, is based off of. The 49ers oh. are people who would rush toward, to California to make, uh, to make a buck or to make uh, their livelihood. And it, I think it specifically referred to a group that was particularly successful at it, oh. namely through violent and often very backhanded means. Right? So that's mostly where that comes from. Mm. The, the experience of California actually did uh, have an impact on how the British officials and the HBC company uh, and the HBC, sorry, actually dealt with this because they kept the discovery of gold that they did find a secret. Right? They didn't actually promote it because they didn't want an onslaught of Americans flooding into their uh, colony or their territory. And we'll talk about later about why that was actually really smart and really important. Right, absolutely. So they at first they were like, okay, there's gold here. We haven't found a lot, I have to say, but there's some. And any kind of rumor of that will be kept as hush as possible. So uh, the governors didn't really uh, talk about it. The HBC company just quietly exploited it, but never sent more than 40 men, I think, at a time to explore, if I remember correctly. And even if they had, it, it seems like most mining attempts were not particularly profitable, right? So... At most, right, and this is kind of where the gold rush starts, they found in total about 800 ounces of gold, right? This is kind of the peak of what they found uh, in the early uh, 1850s, right? So 800 ounces of gold, for those who don't know, is about 50 pounds, right? Which, 
it's still quite a bit, especially considering that gold is a very light metal. Like, so finding 50 pounds of gold is quite a bit, but it's not like a massive amount, right? And so this 800, this 800 ounces, right? So in 1858, it's sent to San Francisco, right? Because the HBC wants to essay it. So basically evaluate its value right? and make sure that it's proper gold and that they can actually use it. So it's sent to San Francisco in February of 1858 and rumor gets out. As it does. Right? As it does. So suddenly it re this ship reaches San Francisco and rumors of a new El Dorado uh, begin to circulate, right? Something up north is happening, right? And the first shipload of fortune seekers, so there's about 400 men on this ship in the first one, arrives in Victoria in April of that year. And basically by August, about 10,000 miners are reported to already be working in that area, searching for a gold rush, They're searching for their riches, basically. Now, let alone the fact that this basically impedes on uh, many, many Native American territories, namely the Stolo and the, I hope I'm not going to butcher this, Nilakapamux territory. I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, but that's mostly where they are situated, right? Um, but yeah, so far, I feel like that's pretty much a conventional gold rush story. Yeah. Nothing really happens, and then suddenly the idea is born, right? And it's really, I think, the except for that very small, quiet beginning. Mm -hmm. Right. But I mean, I guess in that, they they all kind of start off quiet, no? Well, this one was very government oriented, though, wasn't it? Yeah, in a sense, <clears throat> like the slow, quiet beginning of others is usually a lot shorter. Again, it's a rush. Yeah. So things happen very quickly. This one, the fact that it started out with the British government sort of only sending 40 people at a time, being trying to be very sneaky about it, mm -hmm. is its own sort of thing. Absolutely. But I mean, and again, it's kind of interesting that the reason why it was kept quiet is because they kind of wanted to keep, the, the HBC kind of wanted to keep a, a monopoly on what kind of people came in or out. Right? Mm -hmm. They didn't want Americans coming in and taking everything <clears throat> in their territory. Fair enough. Um, so, you know, it, it's a selective kind of uh, process in a way. So um, it's estimated that in total, right, uh, throughout the next few years, so throughout 1858, 9, 60, um, about 20,000 to 30,000 miners came to the Fraser River uh, or the Fraser River Valley, right? And what's kind of interesting, and this is, I think, one of the more interesting aspects of this gold rush is its ultimate impact and its legacy. The gold rush itself is interesting, but it's very similar to like many of them. You get boom towns. Most people don't really make it. Some do. Uh, there is violence, which we'll talk about but by and large, what's interesting is what happens in the aftermath of the gold rush or because of the gold rush, which is completely different from most gold rushes, including the Con Klondike gold rush that we saw before. Uh, I'm going to leave the impact to the end of the episode, but just to kind of give it a sense of what I mean by impact. So basically, Victoria, uh, to give an example, so what had basically been a fur trading post for a long time, by the end of the gold rush, was transformed into a culturally diverse settlement with over, 20, uh, with over 225 commercial buildings and a Chinatown, right? So it was big enough that you had businesses, a whole subsection of people, right, that mm -hmm. had come in, and we'll talk about the Chinese a bit. Uh, for this episode and kind of set it up for next episodes. But you, you definitely have a life that's being, uh, or at least a, uh, a settlement as we uh, understand it today, that's being created here, right? So this kind of gives an idea of what we're talking about here. Just to give sort of the standards on Gold Rush, because you're, the Gold Rushes that would have happened earlier mm -hmm. all happened in the U.S. Yeah. So there really is a framework to be working with at this point, which is, give, which is what gives, the B, gives BC a leg up. Okay. And we'll get a bit more into that. But also the area itself is a very good area for living. It's not, it doesn't have the same sort of like dry heat spill that California might have had. And it's not the same sort of cold that the Klondike had. So there's a lot of environmental factors going on into why this one sustained itself. Yep. Because it is, as you say, gold rushes more often than not result in these boom towns, large mass desertions of the area, mm -hmm. and all these like other big economic ruins. Absolutely.
what do you have a, any kind of knowledge as to early print cultures uh, before we get into the novel itself mm -hmm. uh, that we're going to be talking about? So what kind of print cultures and literatures that you might have been aware of or what kind of people would have been writing at that time in British Columbia? or what were New Caledonia slash eventually mm -hmm. British Columbia? I mean, I'd have to assume it's the usual. There's always going to be journals of expeditions and adventures and explorers and these miners. There's people, there's going to be ledgers mm -hmm. are going to be kept because you have to measure out what kind of gold you have and you want to leave the paper trail so that way if anybody tries to steal your shit, yep. you have a way to get back, get it back. There's going to be tales of romance, I'm sure. There's going to be all sorts of poetry written by would-be aspiring poets. Yep. It's the usual. Absolutely. The usual travel literature, people describing the sites that they're seeing, the cultures, mm -hmm. probably some people going about like, oh, the engines aren't actually that bad. Oh, the shit. Thought. Yeah, but yeah, that's pretty much it. So this is why I was mentioning at the beginning that we're less going to concentrate on that today because we mm -hmm. mostly talked about that a lot with other things. Mm -hmm. So exactly, you'll see uh, exploration books, mainly by James Cook, Simon Fraser, and all of these came mostly in the early to mid 19th century as people were exploring. So if you want other great examples outside of these, you have Milton and Cheadle's uh, The Northwest Passage by Land, which was published in 1865. Uh, Morley Roberts published Western Avenues in 1887. So a lot of these exactly texts that combine both exploration, travel, and romance. And sometimes, obviously, the blending of fact and fiction is kind of wonky at times, <laughs> as things tend to be. Right? In terms of poetry, uh, that's definitely a popular one. There's a whole book that I'll link to in the description that actually features and anthologizes a lot of pioneer poetry at this point, and even includes some uh, Native American um, works from that area. And it's very interesting to see, but again, it's mostly similar to what you saw in the East Coast with a different setting. It's a lot of talking about the environment. It's a lot of talking about the struggles. It's very much talking about- It's a hard knock life for us. It's a hard knock life for us. Da, 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 da. And then somewhere, yep. somewhere's going, the sun will come out tomorrow. <laughs> so you just gotta bet your bottom dollar. I don't know the rest of the song. <laughs> it's, it's Annie, though. I'm calling it now. Okay. So basically, I'm mentioning this because the, a lot of the ideas that are brought up here um, do bring up the central struggle that has kind of appeared in Western literature or like Western Canadian literature since then, right? So kind of trying to find a form of expression that would make it possible to describe and interpret life in a very dramatic and quite varied segment of the Canadian West, right? So mm -hmm. you, you are dealing with different elements than what you see in Eastern Canada. And often you're having to deal with it in a way that innovates while also relying on old ground as to kind of make it different from Eastern Canada and capture that different experience while using old forms of travel writing and poetry. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I want to, something I want to bring up, and this kind of comes back to the idea of the Chinese, right, is that when we refer to Chinese people in Canada, we often refer to them either in their modern context in British Columbia, there, is, there are waves after waves uh, of them that came to British Columbia, or we refer to them in relation to the railroad and the building of it uh, as it happened during and after Confederation. So it's actually kind of interesting because at this time, the Chinese are actually credited with starting a great many newspapers and that actively participated in the setting up of a dynamic print culture in early uh, New Caledonian and British Columbian history, right? which very much differs from what we see in Eastern Canada. Or right? what we're told. Exactly, right? So you have uh, newspapers like the Chinese Times, which again, I might butcher the Chinese name, but it's Dahang Gong Bao. Uh, it had both names. So it's very interesting that it wasn't in English necessarily. It also featured Mandarin or what I assume maybe Cantonese. Um, and again, like I said, there was actually a Chinatown. So there is a significant note of Chinese presence in this area. Sort actively of dispels the myth that it's some sort of new fad thing, right? As if mm -hmm. it's some sort of new random Chinese invasion happening in Vancouver. <laughs> yep. It's almost like populations have been mixing together for centuries. Oh my god. 
Yeah. So Crazy. one of the reasons why actually we mostly associate the Chinese with the railroad is because they were kind of forced into that position, right? In this time, the gold rush brought a lot of them to the coast, namely because it was easier to access the west coast of Canada uh, from China than it was the east coast, where they would basically have to do the tour of the world. Um, and the thing is, because of massively racist policies and just individual spite towards a nebulous other, a lot of Chinese populations were pushed out of BC or forced to seek their fortunes elsewhere outside of the gold rush. Mm -hmm. right? So while we have elements that prove that they were there, like the newspapers, uh, like the Chinatown, they were always in a kind of segregated or pushed out uh, kind of situation, right? which kind of pushed them east and, you know, forcing them to become a bit more of a cheap labor for the Canadian or British government uh, when it came time to build the railroad. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to mention this here, and I'll try to bring that back when we talk about the Deadly Five, but it's definitely something that we have to address here, is that they were there. It wasn't just a purely white or Native American thing, right? Also, by the way, Native Americans did participate in the gold rush and were used as well. Um, and as we saw many times, they were also kind of forgotten. There's a great many resources about that. I'll also link to them in the description. From Again, providing I a solid foundation of why BC will remain. Yeah. This isn't, again, this isn't um, journals or poetry. This is a newspaper. Yeah. And that's a sure sign of somebody settling down. Absolutely, because you need to bring a printing press, right? Like, compare it to... You need to set up the machinery. You need to, like, to build a Chinatown gives the idea that there are multiple boroughs. Oh, yeah, exactly. Which is much more than any boom town would have had. The boom town would have been divided into, like, bar section, prostitute section, big lump of tents where everybody lives. Okay, is that how they were mostly uh, set up? Not, again, very general <clears throat> sort of for way, sure, but... For sure. <clears throat> Well, I mean, you can kind of see that in, again, my kind of reference for this is Deadwood. <laughs> We've talked about this in uh, our Klondike episode. But um, yeah, you kind of definitely see something like that. In Deadwood, there is a Chinese element also, by the way, and they also have their little Chinatown. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it's very interesting in how it depicts, similar to what we're seeing in British Columbia, this kind of demonization of a people and the segregation of them. Um, and you see it as well, if you want to bring it back to a prostitution corner uh, that a lot of Boomtown saw, it also kind of plays into how we view different parts of society. Mm -hmm. They're over there. They're outside the mainstream element of society, right? They're not quite a part of formal white British Columbian society. They can be a way, we, ex we, we barely acknowledge their presence. And if we do, it's outside, over there, right? So anyway, um, coming up to our actual book for this week. So The Deadly Five by Raymond Mayer. Uh, had you ever heard of this book before? It's very recent. Nope. And Not when I tried all. to look it up, I found the Hong Kong movie Five Deadly Venoms. Yeah. I don't think it's a very popular book, but I do think it kind of... Uh, brings together a lot of the ideas that we were bringing up here. So I, I thought it would be kind of interesting to discuss it. There's another book that looks really interesting if you want something similar. Um, it's called Orphans of Empire, which is also a novel. I unfortunately could not find a copy of it in time to talk about it here, um, but it also looks particularly interesting. And uh, Orphans of Empire was actually shortlisted for a bunch of awards. So I'm actually really curious to talk about that one or to at least read that one if we don't talk about it on the show. What are your kind of opening thoughts about The Deadly Five from what you know of it? Right? Yeah, and as it relates little. to the British, uh, to the British Columbian gold rush. <laughs> well, it's about, about lawlessness and violence in the frontier, right? Yeah. Or That's at a least, pretty standard story. It's a pretty standard story, but I think he does some really interesting things with it. I mean, right. and so, for, no, what I mean is that it's cowboys and lawlessness and frontiers have always gone hand in hand. Yeah. You have in your notes the myth of the peaceful frontier. I've never heard that myth. I've only ever really? heard the myth of the violent frontier. Okay. Like, well, there is actually kind of a myth. We can talk about this. So, yeah, uh, anyway, keep going. Uh, but we can actually talk about that. Well, yeah, it's just, you know, Westerns exist for a reason. We, we love our stories of gunslinging cowboys and all that fun stuff. Mm -hmm. That's not what a cowboy did, but... Yeah. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. And it's kind of interesting because one of the things that Mayer does, does with his book is he kind of plays with this idea as to whether or not the violence was real. And, like, 
he plays with this idea of whether or not the crimes purported to have happened and uh, uh, to have been committed by the uh, main characters, the so-called Deadly Five, were true or not, right? So he kind of plays with this element. Now, to come back to this myth, right, that you were talking about, it kind of plays into, there, there is for a long time, and we know now that it's bullshit because there was a literal Frasier Canyon war, right, between, that was fueled by racial tensions, clash tensions, just uh, tensions between people who were looking for gold, right? Uh, so there was actual arms conflict um, in this area around the 1850s. But there was for a long time this idea that British Columbia was a more peaceful settlement. Right. And it kind of plays into the aftermath. Right. Because basically what happened was when people started arriving in April, June, uh, July, right. Basically, it didn't take very long before the British government actually put into place formalized laws and a formal structure to maintain uh, law and order in British Columbia. So basically, by August, the British government had formally taken control of British Columbia and made it a, pro uh, a colony. Which really, again, gives it more stability compared to other cities and locations. Exactly. But that's where the myth of the peaceful settlement comes from. Because so, this is, so this is very specifically only British Columbia then? Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, that's what I meant, right? It might not have been clear by the, by the notes, but yes, absolutely. Specifically British Columbia. And again, it is a myth. <laughs> there was a great deal of violence. Um, perhaps less than what you saw in California or perhaps the Klondike. But there was definitely, very quickly, this ability to set up a system of government that said, okay, this is the law of the land. And most famously, you had uh, Judge Matthew Begbie, who's a character in The Deadly Five, who kind of represented this law and order. Mm -hmm. right? Basically, he was the colony's first judge. Okay, very um, cool. Yeah, very cool. And what I really like about the novel, in a sense, is that Begbie as a character is extremely complex, right? Generally in these things, when you, especially with a figure of authority, you tend to see them either as a villain, depending on the story, or a clear-cut good guy, depending, again, on the perspective. Mm -hmm. But what's kind of interesting with The Deadly Five is that Mayer doesn't seem to take Aside on this, he definitely addresses the complexity of Begbie as a judge. So as someone who was interested in law and order, but that was also definitely tainted by his time's own um, prejudices, I guess you could say. So under, for example, Begbie's uh, tenure, more, uh, more often than not, it was Native Americans, Chinese, African Americans that were actually arrested and put on trial um, much more than any kind of white person uh, during the Fraser Gold Rush, right, for any kind of violence. So you kind of see the two sides of this coin in the novel in a way that I think is very interesting. And that kind of differs from the way a lot of uh, frontier um, frontier stories kind of depict authority, which tends to be in a more negative light. Right. Did, did you actually have a chance to uh, read any part of the novel? Or no, not The really. Deadly Five? Yeah. No. Awesome. I couldn't find it online. I couldn't. Sorry, friend. <sighs> oh, it's fine. I'll... No, but I have read yeah. other stories similar to sort of talking. Again, like mm -hmm. Western literature is not something that is unfamiliar to me. So I'm sure right. I can see the bare bones of what the story would be. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's kind of interesting because we were talking about journals, right, before yeah. as kind of one of those initial examples of a kind of literature that was forming there yeah. uh, in the Fraser River Valley. Because it was the easiest one to do. Absolutely. And Mayer actually reflects that in his writing. It's written as a journal. Very cool. Yeah, which, honestly, reading it, I found a bit difficult because it felt a bit forced. <laughs> it didn't seem like a natural way of writing uh, a journal to me. It felt uh, like it uh, was having a lot of exposition because he's telling a story. Um, so instead of feeling like a more natural thought process that some settler was writing down and were left to fill in the blanks because the person writing it at the time just assumed things, Mayer seems to be forcing in certain character elements so as to build the story. So I feel like the journal element kind of, um, kind of falters in a sense. Right. But I do think that it is an interesting touch uh, to actually add that. And it definitely 
plays into some of the elements of erasure that we're talking about, right? Of the Chinese, of the Native Americans, of all of, uh, of African Americans that were also there. Mm -hmm. right? So because it's told from one perspective or as close to one perspective as you can get with journals. Mm -hmm. so, you, so that's one of the issues with this book is that, but it's also, I think, deliberate, is that you kind of forget a lot of the Chinese uh, that are there or other people who are there that might not have... Uh, that, that, that have kind of been forgotten over time, right? So he does kind of reflect certain things in the very form of his uh, writing. Of his writing. That's, I think that's kind of cool. Yeah, no, it's, it's an interest. And it's always going to be probably one of the best ways to tell those sort of stories is using journals just because it reflects mm -hmm. so well. Most Western stories you see include a journaling element of some kind. Yes. Absolutely. Just because of that's how the main mode of communication was. So it's right. sort of an honor system in that way. Absolutely. Um, I feel it's kind of interesting though, when we kind of always touch upon this as a topic, right, when we're addressing especially a more contemporary view, right, is that outside of Begbie and the general context of the Fraser Gold Rush, mm -hmm. right, he doesn't really base himself on reality, right? So he, he's just kind of imagining a lot of these things for the sake of it. So I feel like it's it's an interesting thing to look at to see if he captures the experience of frontier life, right? Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that or uh, like the ability of us to capture the, the, the this experience with hindsight, maybe more or less, um, considering the information that we have today. Um, but I felt like it would have been perhaps a bit more successful as a novel had he focused a bit more on the historical realities of it, rather than just creating something from scratch. Although, as you say, there is a lot that you can say just from other uh, gold rushes. Mm -hmm. I don't know uh, if you had any thoughts about the ability to recreate that experience um, with the hindsight, but... I think it's, as it's not... I don't want to say something that diminishes, but it's always going to be something that people will draw to. Because right. again, that sense of exploration is always something we want. The sense it's the same way why pirate stories are still so popular. Mm -hmm. Because you're literally running around in an unknown territory searching for gold and riches and so on and so forth. So yeah. and as also we all have that little boy bit of defying defiance in the law and such, you know? Yeah. I just think, you know, I love a good Western, so I probably am going to pick up this book. <laughs> right. I've been meaning to read more of them. This sounds like it'd be a perfect <laughs> way to do it. Right. Um, but it, it kind of opens in an interesting way, and it kind of, uh, uh, it'll give you an idea of his writing style. So this is the first paragraph of chapter one, right? Where he mm -hmm. says, quote, uh, this is someone speaking, somebody is going to get stinking rich, and that somebody is me. I often say it because why shouldn't it be getting, uh, why shouldn't it be me getting that gold that is being found in Canada? All I want there is enough gold for a lifetime or two. Mm -hmm. I'll gamble my life in the wilderness ahead for gold that is all mine. Right now, I have nothing to do but to think on this <laughs> here packed steamer. Nice. Very yeah, nice. I, I, I kind of appreciate that. Um, it shows, right, the kind of rugged individualism that permeated a lot of these things. It's me versus them uh, kind of thing. And also, I like the touch of this here packed steamer. Just the language that he uses. Is, this here packed steamer? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It very much feels like a real person wrote this in some ways, mm -hmm. right? Like he's using a kind of vernacular that I think adds some legitimacy to it. Right? And it kind of plays into this ability to recreate an experience. His writing is very non-descriptive in a lot of ways. Right? He skips a lot of parts, especially action scenes. Um, but I think in a way, when you think of it in a more metatextual sense, it kind of makes sense, right? Because you do leave things out of a, out of a narrative when you write it as a travel uh, thing. But you don't write da everything down. Um, or when you do, sometimes you create things. Obviously, your example of uh, John Smith is uh, is one that you've brought up before, where things are just created out of nowhere in, the, in some of those nar narratives. So I do think he definitely points to and captures what drove the Fraser Gold Rush. Something that I wanted to mention, right? And this kind of comes back into this idea of violence and lawlessness. And I think it also kind of this fits. This town ain't big enough for the two of us. Oh yeah, that definitely comes up in the novel. For I'm sure. Dirty Dan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, damn it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but uh, it kind of plays up in the form form of the novel is that 
you know, one of the ideas that helped build this myth of a peaceful frontier, like we were saying, is the rapidity of it all, right? Mm -hmm. And to me, this will kind of play back into opening up to the larger impact of the Fraser Gold Rush, is that the whole idea of it, not only the fact that the British took over formally uh, and made British Columbia a colony, but the actual Fraser Gold Rush itself, as a boom, happened extremely quickly. So you didn't have much time to actually, you know, um, explore, uh, how, how can I say this? You didn't actually have much time to delve into this violence or ha uh, let this violence play out for a long period of time. Gold was discovered en masse in February. By August, it was a colony with laws, rules, and regulations, mm -hmm. right? And I feel like, I don't think this is intentional on Mayer's part, but I do think it kind of plays in nicely that the way that he's writing by forgetting certain parts and that passing over uh, certain elements in a very brisk way does kind of reflect this in a textual sense, right? The actual yeah. violence of it is very much skipped over, right? Uh, and we leave room very quickly in the novel to the law and order part of it, whether it's true or not, whether it had an impact or not. And I think that's interesting. I don't know if he meant it or not. I say no, but it's very possible that he intended it that way. Um, but I do think that it is an interesting thing to bring up, right? I kind of noticed that while reading. I was like, okay, I can see that this is a thing. Like, it could be an interesting thing to bring up. So in terms of the impact, obviously, right, we can talk about the First Nations. They were directly on the territory, like the, the gold rush happened directly on a territory that had not been formally ceded, right, to the HBC. And this is something that we'll talk about a bit more at, uh, in future episodes, but the way in which uh, the Hudson's Bay Company uh, and the British government were doing treaties by then was much different. It didn't quite do the same thing by the time it reached BC as it had done in Eastern Canada. So sometimes some of the treaties or relations between settlers and Native American peoples was sketchy at best. It already was in a treaty form, but because they had already been changed to be less formalized or non-existent, it was also just a different kind of sketchy, basically. So obviously, from the perspective of the Stolo and Nlaka Pamuks people that I mentioned earlier, despite them being the first to actually discover gold and use it as a trading tool, let's just say that from their perspective, the fortune seekers of 1858-59 weren't really just claim jumpers, but they were actually foot soldiers in a sense, right? right? They were very much part of what could have been seen as a kind of deliberate invasion, even if it wasn't seen in necessarily military terms. But this idea of deliberately sending people out in search of golden glory and God. Um, golden glory. So yeah, that definitely feels like an invasion in many senses. Right? So I can definitely see from their perspective that- well, it, it also must seem like a nonsensical invasion. Like they would not get why everybody's hunting for gold. It's just not part of their value system. Right, exactly. And so they would have been really confused. Like, Oh, like 30,000 people just showing up and they're like, but why though? Oh, you must be here for like the rich farmland, yeah. the beautiful nature, the nice food, the bounty of the land. And they're just like, we want rocks. Yeah. We want shiny thing. Like we, we always because... make fun of like the trade with the Oklahoma landlords. They trade for a bunch right. of glass beads or whatever. Mm -hmm. But then they must have thought the same thing when we showed up and we were just like shiny metal rock. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we kind of saw that with, um, with Brian Moore and Black Robe, right? When we were talking about that. The perspective that the natives have on the French is very much like, is if very much in the way he describes it parallels the way that the French see the natives in many ways as both of them see them as a kind of weird backward people for many different ways in many different perspectives. Um, and yeah, I definitely think that um, that definitely comes up in, um, in this idea, especially I think in British Columbia. And, I'll, uh, and I want to touch upon this, uh, this specificity of place again uh, in concluding remarks, but this idea that there was almost nothing 
that the Europeans had settled in British Columbia until then. And then it suddenly exploded. Right. It's a different kind of boomtown. It's a permanent right. boomtown in a sense, right? Um, whereas at best, the Spanish and then the British fully had a few trading colonies. Okay, and yeah, James Cook had some really wild experiences with uh, Unnutka Sound, as we saw. But, and then suddenly you have 20,000 people. And you're like, what the hell is going on? Like, what, how do you deal with that? Right? You can't. Like, there, there's, I don't think there's a like, legit way that you can actually process a, such a rapid change. Okay. Right. Anyway. I feel you. Right. So, and obviously the gold rush kind of formally began the process of colonization of British Columbia. Right. So the effects of which are still being felt to this very day. And as we'll continue, we'll see exactly how that colonization played out. In terms of a more Eurocentric perspective, right? So by the end of the year, as I was mentioning, it wasn't just limited to the urbanization that I mentioned earlier, right? Of Victoria becoming a fully fledged city, right? That would actually become the capital of BC, right? It is some. It goes a bit beyond that, right? So in August of 1858, New Caledonia became British Columbia uh, mm -hmm. through an act of British uh, Parliament. James Douglas, who was the governor of the colony of Vancouver Island, became also the government, uh, the governor, sorry, of British Columbia. At the time, they were not the same thing. It remained two separate colonies for some time, British Columbia and Vancouver. And the HBC monopoly over the rest of Canada was formally revoked at this point. Oh. Right? So basically, they still had everything in between BC and Ontario. So I'm mm -hmm. not crying for the HBC. But it's at this point where, you know, it, they no longer have everything else. Right? And right. it's around this time that, obviously, you start to hear more and more discussions about, well, what about the rest of Canada, right? Because okay. part of, right, what we're saying here, and I mentioned this, is that we wanted to stop an unruly amount of Americans coming up mm -hmm. right, and taking all our gold. But what about the other places, right? There, there are resources in other parts of Canada, right? And so... What do, what do we do about this? Can the HBC really take care of protecting all of these things? Right? And so as the Confederation project really starts advancing, the idea of buying up the rest of the land slowly starts to become taken more and more seriously, very much for the same reasons that we saw British Columbia becoming a colony in and of itself. Right, okay. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's a bit of an interesting segue or like opening up to this general idea. Right? So just to kind of lay out an idea to you, right? When you imagine British Columbia, do you see the gold rush as foundational to your, to the, no? To, no? Okay. It's not something that I really knew about. I'm definitely okay. surprised and I'm definitely surprised at how important it was, but it's not something that I'm like, oh yeah, this is what I thought of before. What was it that you thought of before? Because I'm curious now, like how did about you imagine? About how it came to founding? Yeah. I'm not sure. I just sort of assumed it was like the rest of Canada in the form of trading posts. Okay. Interesting. But yeah. You, I mean, in a way it was, I think it was kind of inevitable that it would become that. Yeah, but the, but the have such a background in the gold. What about you? What did you think? I, I had heard of the Fraser Valley gold rush right before, before coming here, uh, before doing this episode, okay. but it hadn't entered my consciousness as much as other gold rushes. I yeah. was much more aware of Klondike, California, that kind of thing. Well, what do you think about going off of that? What do you think of the differences between the Fraser gold rush and the Klondike one? I think for me, right, this comes back to an idea of geography. I think what allowed British Columbia to use that gold rush to become itself, as we understand it today, much more quickly, I think is very much integral to its geography. So its proximity to the United States mm -hmm. and also the time in which it was created. So compared to Klondike, right, which is in the Yukon, it's a much more cold and unforgiving territory. So you had a much harder time to actually incite people to actually go up there and stay there permanently. Right. Right. So when the actual boom was over, people were kind of excited to actually fuck off because it was cold as dirt most of the year. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Do you see what I mean? Whereas in, yeah, yeah. Whereas in uh, BC, already is it a bit warmer in many parts of it than what we see in Quebec and Ontario already, but you had already colonies established there. And so there was definitely more of an incentive to stay there once the boom was over, which 
theoretically, a lot of estimates uh, say that the Cal uh, that the gold rush in Fraser River in the Fraser River Valley ended in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. It was minimal by then. It's basically like people kept mining, but after a few years, the major boom had ended. So it was mostly just a regular mining little thing that people looked at oh, for that time. Okay, it did yeah. not last for 40 years. It mm -hmm. exploded. It came back down and then petered out. Mm -hmm. Right for for basically forty years. Oh, okay, I, can, I think I can get that. And so yeah, and also the question of time, right? That I wanted to 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 bring up. The idea of industrialization was something that was very much in the minds of people at the time. The minds of the people. Exactly, the minds of the people. Anyway, yeah, gold rush joke. <laughs> No, but this idea of industrialization was definitely there already. And where in, where in the East, we had already seen the building of certain railroads that were namely, by the way, financed by none other than John Molson, the famous brewing company. So a lot of those first railroads in Canada were financed by the beer magnet <laughs> and shipbuilder for the British military also. Um, but you also had this idea, right? So you suddenly have this colony and a straight line in between. So you can definitely have this very easy image of an industrial frontier, right? You have an end in sight where you can say, well, before we were kind of unsure as to where this whole project was going, mm -hmm. right? But we have now with British Columbia and the Fraser Gold Rush, a very definitive endpoint. We have the coast from one coast to another, right? Uh, from right. sea to shining sea, as we as we understand it today. From sea to shining sea. But I, I think that's a very interesting thing to bring up. And by the way, to bring it back to the novel, I think that's something that he brings up as well, is this kind of solidifying of this blind spot in the imagination. And this is something mm -hmm. that we saw mm -hmm. with Simon Fraser as well. It's kind of the last frontier of Canada in a way. Much more, I think, than the Klondike Gold Rush, which once you move west, it's kind of moving north, but towards an un more unforgiving territory. I don't know. Did you have any thoughts about that? About like the differences between different gold rushes? I think this again, the government interference in this one was yeah. definitely a major point of stability mm -hmm. and why the survival came. Yeah. It's it's how do I explain this? It's just this the because this became Vancouver, right? It be, became Vancouver and DC. Yeah. Exactly. So there's a reason for that. And I think I also think there's a strong cultural element going on here in the fact that there is this large Chinese population creating yeah. their own borough, already creating this strong, significant other mm -hmm. that makes it sort of different every, from everywhere else, you know? Yeah. Because you definitely had other cultures being part of every gold rush. That's a fact. Yeah. But this one seems like it's much more important to the foundation of the city, of yeah. the, the territory or whatever, the province. I would say so. And and again, that, that it's their, they put in the law. They send in a government community. They do this, they do that to make sure everything is working the way it needs to, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I'm actually curious, like, because you know more a bit about the Klondike and all that because you were, you were working up there and all. Why do you think that there was no government intervention? Because it happened after BC. The so they would have, yeah, they would have had that experience with British Columbia location. going into it. Okay, so it's location. I got to think it's partially that. It's just you don't want, you almost don't want to have to, the amount of resources it would take to create a self-sustaining place up there. Yeah. And you still and there's that. still a town there. They're definitely yeah. Dawson's... Uh, uh, did Dawson City? No. Dawson City, that's the one. <laughs> Were you going to say Dawson. Dawson's Creek? Maybe. <laughs> and so, and, but it's also the difficulty there because the rivers would freeze over and they'd have to wait for supplies, and it was a big logistical nightmare. You can't say that about Vancouver and BC. There, there's definitely some difficulty, but it's not the same. But it's not the same sort of logistical nightmare going on. You know? Right. Absolutely. It's interesting. Um, yeah, I, I also like to kind of bring it back to industrialization in a sense with what you were saying about the call uh, with the, the the other right in the chinese because if anything right we know this today industrialization is one of those things that tends to displace people right in a variety of ways shape and form it displaces the environment which displaces people it puts certain people out of jobs and then creates other ones like there's a whole mechanism behind this industrialization right, right? so go ahead oh it's just because i'm still thinking about the klondike one a bit yeah. i think there was also the fact that it was also american sponsored partially oh uh, okay so right. that probably fucked things because if they because then if you let's say you try and create a legit settlement who's how are you going to split it who's going to yeah. control what parts 
And plus you were saying before you had the Russians that were not far. Yeah, exactly. So like, 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 if, if they created, if they really tried to keep this settlement going, I'm sure America would have said, well, we want it to be our settlement. Yeah. And that's absolutely. always going to be something Canada's wanting to avoid. Yeah. It's something that you literally see to this day when you talk about like military bases up north, like who owns the right to actually do that up there, right? Yeah. Because you're talking about like the Arctic and things like that. So the <laughs> borders are kind of nebulous. So yeah, I can definitely see that as a thing. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's kind of interesting to me that right, BC became this frontier of industrialization, this literal endpoint, right, like I said, for the railroad. Um, and it did that in a sense by displacing the Chinese people that they wanted to forget and then using them in the railroad that they were creating in order uh to make it a fully fledged British colony, right? Or a Canadian colony that was white right mm -hmm. it's kind of this weird double thing that's happening of simultaneously using and forgetting this nebulously defined other which i kind of think is interesting and i think we should definitely be kept in mind as we're moving forward into confederation so if you had any final thoughts like now would be the time but if you wanted to gather any i have a little quote from a book called beyond hope which is an illustrated history of the fraser gold rush which i think is kind of interesting to mention here this is by beverly boissery and brownwin short uh, brownwin short which i think is a really great book and great summary of the of the rush so it says, in the short term, the gold rush brought economic hard times. Unlike okay. Australia and California, where the miners settled after slaking their thirst for gold, most of BC's gold seekers returned to their homes. And it took many years before the population returned to the dizzying heights of the 1860s. So you still had these settlements being formed, but they were very much unstable, right? Yeah. As well, the ecological damage wrought by the miners took decades to repair and in some instances was permanent. The First Nations people also went permanent change, right? For them, there was no miraculous happy ending, and the gold rush meant only profound desolation, right? Um, once the shout of, quote, gold on the Fraser was heard and answered worldwide, change became inevitable. The resource-rich wilderness of New Caledonia, where First Nations and Hudson Bay employees coexisted relatively amicably, changed overnight into the colony of British Columbia, a place where men driven by greed would plunder the land in their compulsive search for more gold. Right? I think that kind of sums up a lot of what we're talking about here, both the simultaneous instability and inevitable change that would eventually stabilize uh, with British Columbia. Anyway... <laughs> I think that's my final thought. I think that kind of sums it up. I don't know if you had anything that you um, wanted to add, but... About cowboy towns and... About all of it. Maybe something that we haven't addressed that you wanted to bring up and be like, oh, I wanted to talk about this. Well, there's a lot of stuff I want to talk about. You know that. Go for it. What do you want to talk about? I just, I just, I love the idea of exploration. I do think Fraser is probably more the exception than the rule of how these yeah. gold rushes went and how they finished and ended up. But I, I also think, think so. it goes to show we can make things work. We can make any sort of town work. You just have to put the time and the effort in. Interesting. Okay. Well, because, you know, these sort of boom towns were abandoned afterwards because everybody said, oh, there's no gold. The gold's all dried up. Therefore, there's no point staying here. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold up there. Hold up there, friend. Mm -hmm. you've, probably, you've, you've probably been living here for 20, 30 years. You've probably made a life here. Why not try and enjoy it? Because Why I have another gold stability? rush to go to. Yeah. You know, I've got another gold rush happening down the river, man. It's going to be lit. You want to come? I have another gold rush in this place called the Klondike. Yo, yo, my girl, she's got me hooked up to this other gold rush. It's going to be dope. <laughs> Absolutely much better than this one. This one's played out, man. I don't know, man. This one's kind of dying down. <laughs> 40 yo, years later. You hear Jameson's at this big Klondike happening? It's going to be <laughs> fucking lit. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> no, but I think it I think you are right in pointing to the fact that in a way a lot of these gold rushes each represent their own exceptions, mm -hmm. right? In the American context with the California gold rush, you had this untamed look at it, right? Mm -hmm. Which is just like a, a kind of a stereotypical American idea of go at it and it's the american dream right of manifest destiny of saying like go and the actual person with the most success wins right now obviously there's a whole bunch of issues with that but that was kind of the idea right that inspired the california gold rush which then informed how the fraser gold rush was being produced which then informed how the klondike was produced right so there is a link between all of these in a sense but 
I think you're right in that it all kinds of it all kind of sums up into this distinct culture for each one of them and this distinct history for each one of them that I think is very, very interesting. Okay. Well, unless you had anything else to say. Go enjoy a Western, folks. They're fun. <laughs> they are fun. Right. Absolutely. If you don't like to read, watch Deadwood. If you like to read, read The Deadly Five. It's available on Google Play and it's probably available to, on Amazon or something. I don't know. There you go. Don't support Amazon. But, um, or, you know, find Orphans of the Empire, right? That book that we mentioned also that could be interesting that if you've read it, tell us, right? Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, Mac, what can people do to help out the show or reach out? I'll tell you what they can do. Oh. Tell your friends, spread the word so we mm -hmm. can be firmly stuck in the top 100. <laughs> Support the show through PayPal as it pay what you feel the show is worth. Follow us on social media, on Twitter, Facebook, send us an email. If you, if you have a complaint and you hate something we said, let us know. If you hate everything we said, let us know. Yeah, we love it. I love getting told when I'm wrong. Honestly, I kind of do. I like to learn that way. No, it's fun. You have, how else are we going to grow? Exactly. Yep, absolutely. Hey, if you even want to send an email just to say we like the show, that's cool too. Yeah. Like it doesn't like have it, to be a question it, or anything. Yeah. Hate it. Just, just get in contact, man. Spread the word. Yeah, absolutely. This is something also, by the way, um, like one of the things that pe uh, that we did, and I, I mentioned it on the show, there was a listener, Via, who actually sent out a whole list of questions, and it very much informed how we, uh, how mm -hmm. I planned out the rest of the episodes, right? Uh, so like a lot of the questions that she brought up, I was like, oh, that's really interesting, and I hadn't thought of it. And so uh, I mentioned it on the show, I, I talked about it with Mac and like, I'm trying to integrate it into the actual show. So definitely send any questions, right? If you have any, and we'll try to integrate them. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Or, you know, just leave, like I said, leave a review. Support Mac on Patreon. So us, both of us. It's not just me, it's That's Patrick true. too. Let's support his show. Yeah. There you it's go. It's a great show, I promise. It really is. We put we previews about, up. A... We talked about the grass. It was awesome. Yeah. And moose jaws. And moose jaws. <laughs> all right well thank you very much everyone for listening and we'll see you next time on historia canadiana i promise well mostly promise that the next show will be out on time barring we'll any try. internet inter uh, barring any internet inconveniences it should be on time maybe who knows <laughs> could be fake all right see you all later everyone bye <laughs> cheers <laughs>